I've traveled many roads, but I'm so far from done. I have been hopeless and I've had my faith. Some things I've lost and some things I have saved. All of these moments showed me the way that I've gone. Good to know there's so much to live for. PilotSafety.org is a volunteer group dedicated to reducing general aviation accidents by providing free and low-cost training and safety resources for pilots. Learn more now at PilotSafety.org. Our speaker today is Gary Reeves. Gary has over 6,000 hours, is an ATP, and a master flight, instrument, and multi-engine instructor. He volunteers as a young Eagles flight leader for the EAA and a nationally recognized expert in Garmin avionics, IFR, iPad use, and mountain flying. In 2016, Gary was awarded the FAA Instructor of the Year for the Western Pacific region, which includes Arizona, California, Hawaii, and Nevada. This means he is one of the top eight instructors in the whole country. There are 112,000 instructors in the U.S. Less than 800 have ever been named master. California only has 13. Please welcome 2016 Western Pacific Regional Instructor of the Year Master CFI, Gary Reeves. How y'all doing? So somebody once called me high maintenance and I said just because I drink tea out of a Tigger cup with organic Big Bear Creme Brulee Caramel Honey. That's a little unfair. But my favorite part is having you guys on the webinars and just kind of imagining that you're all clapping somewhere. This is the last time you're gonna see me. We're really gonna focus on all the cool stuff Avonine says. But I just wanted to say hi and thank you again for personally coming. And that's very funny. Several people are using the questions feature to hit clap, clap, clap. Brock, you are my uh, new number one fan. So what's really cool about this is just in May of 2016, a really cool company called Avidine named me as their uh, national training, uh, national approved training provider. And what's so exciting about this is I will tell you all right off the bat, 
I have been and will continue to be Garmin's big fan. I have made a very nice living going around the country teaching Garmin avionics. And I had a Garmin 430 in my personal plane. And then I saw the Avidyne. And I'm like, well, this just looks easier. And I just recently got my own Avidyne IFD 440. And oh my gosh, it's just better at everything. It's smarter. It's easier to use. It's way better than their touch screens. If you have a Garmin, that's great. And, a, and it's still a good product. Just Avidyne really has kind of invented like the better mousetrap. And I just want to show you some of the features that you can do. And just a big, huge thank you to Avidyne, especially a couple guys named Jared and Simpson who really supported me from the beginning. I really appreciate their help. But this is really just the beginning. This is a 90 minute or however long my voice lasts. And it's gonna cover as many features and how to use them as quick as I can. But it is only a start. This is not the class to teach you every little feature. We do have that coming. Um, you can actually pre-order it now over on pilotsafety.org. We have over five hours where I talk much, much slower and I'm gonna discuss every detail, page, sub-menu, especially the shortcuts and the pro trips. Um, I've recently put in about 10 hours of pretty hard IFR flying with the Avidyne, and I'm gonna show you some shortcuts that uh, and some pro tips that may not be in the POH, but we have that. But this is just a really good introduction. You'll also be able to meet and see me at every national show, and Avidyne has all of these great trainers um, and reps for the company with actual Avidyne units that can show you how to use stuff at the national shows as well. What am I going to cover as fast as I can? Well, the functions of the keys and the knobs, power on self-test, updating databases, Calm nav and source tuning, the chapters and pages, custom waypoints, flight planning, IFR procedures, and some alerts. So let's start out with the basic unit. And most of the pictures I'm going to use tonight are from the Avidyne IFD 440. There is essentially no difference in the function and menus between the 440, the 540, and the 550. They all have the same buttons, essentially, and they all work exactly the same way. So if you have the Avidyne uh, 550, great. If you have the Avidyne 540, great. All of this will still apply. So in the top left is your volume power squelch knob. Off to the right is the CDI nav source. Both of these will push and twist, and I'll show you those functions. We have an ambient light sensor, which can be set uh, as the auto dimming feature, and I'll show you why that's best. The frequency swap that works for COM and nav. We have line select keys. Now you notice there's three blank line keys, and off to the right, there's three soft buttons on the touch screen land, nav, and weather overlay. One of the best things about Avidyne, and like I said, I've got, you know, about 10 hours of pretty hard IFR, dodge and rye mice, and moderate turbulence, all touchscreen devices. Uh, the iPad, GTN, anything touchscreen is pretty much totally useless in moderate turbulence and above. So one of the advantages that Avidyne does is everything you can do with touchscreen you can also do with a button, which is not available on other units. So you can either touch the button that says land or touch the line select key to the left of that and it does the same thing. We have some built-in dedicated function keys. Obviously the most important ones are direct to procedure, an enter button and a clear button and we'll, we'll cover all of those. The cam latch is where you put in the I think it's a whatever 30 second size Allen wrench. I got to tell you, the best thing about this is it's truly plug and play. The installation cost to install my Avidyne 
uh, 440 to replace my 430 was nothing. I did it, and it took me 15 minutes. Stuck in the Allen wrench, unscrewed the Garmin, put in the Avidine, tightened it up, set two configuration pages, I was done. I also made a maintenance entry in my logbook that is uh, legally required, and it's important to do that. I checked with a, a couple mechanics and some FISDO people, but there was no downtime, and that's what's awesome. It really is just the Garmin made much better, and that is a huge benefit if you want to quickly swap out. The other cool thing that this has that my previous unit didn't have is a USB port. That's how you update the databases, but much more important to me, that's how I charge my iPad in flight. Like I said, I, you know, I, I fly all over the country and I, I fly several hundred hours a year between mountain flying and instrument training and whatever I'm doing. And the biggest problem I've had with my iPad, whether I'm running FlyQ or For Flight, my two favorite apps, is the iPad always dies after about three and a half hours, usually when I'm on final approach. Never again, because now I can just hook up a USB straight to my iPad, and it keeps my iPad charged the entire time. I recently did a four hour and 15 minute flight and landed at an iPad of 80% because it kept it that way, even though it was talking by Wi-Fi to a Stratus for a full AHARS weather and ads B solution. So it's really, really great to have the USB port right there. We also have the three different chapters, and, and Avidine calls these pages, I call them chapters, because there are several unique functions inside of each one. So I say there's three chapters, FMS, Map, and Auxiliary. The Avidine POH will call those pages. And then there's the Context Sensitive knob, and that knob, as well as the ComNav Manual Tuning knob, there's a small inner knob and a bigger outer knob which are very similar in functions to other products. Again, if you have any questions at any time, please use the questions feature. I will stop occasionally and get to as many as I can. I do have a couple hundred people online tonight, so I'll do the best. So power, volume, and squelch is all controlled by that upper left button. You twist it right to turn the volume up. You twist it left for the volume down. And you push it once for the volume test and the power on. So what's that look like? Just like this. Touch it once. That's power on. And let's do a quick database check. And you can see my USB port is open because I typically have a cable plugged into my iPad. We'll go through the splash screen. Press enter that I've read the POH. I have a valid nav data and an expired obstacle data because one white's one yellow. Then I'll hit confirm. So when you see the database splash screen, anything white is current and anything uh, expired will be yellow. What's required for IFR approaches is the nav database, not the obstructions. And that's the one I keep current. So Anthony Romano, hey Anthony, you have a good question. You'll notice right below my Avidine, I have the Antique Garmin 300 XL. And do they talk and interface? No, they work together very well, but they don't talk to each other. I keep the Garmin 300 as a simple backup system. Now, in my plane, I actually run four completely independent GPS units. I run an Avidine, which is my primary navigation. I have a Garmin 300, which is always my backup and is always tuned to the nearest airport in case of emergency. I have an iPad that runs FlyQ, and I have an iPhone 6 Plus that runs ForeFlight. Why? Because I'm a backup, backup, backup guy. You may not need all that, but that's what I'm running. But I also do a lot of mountain flying, and all those terrain systems really do help. So true or false, you can legally fly IFR with an expired aviation database using the Avidine IFD systems. It's 100% true if you can back it up, but you can't use it for approaches as your primary mode of navigation. You can always use it for approaches 
as a situational awareness. So what that means is even if the NAV database is expired, you can still shoot an ILS approach and have the geo reference on the Avidine makes you safer, but you can't shoot a GPS approach in actual IMC. You can do a VFR practice approach. So let's talk about the NAV radio volume. Pretty much works the exact same way. When do you want to listen to a NAV radio? Well, talk in a flight service. Make sure all of you know that 122.0 Flight Watch or EFOS has been decommissioned. It's gone. You can no longer call Flight Watch. So that means you need to be able to call the nearest flight service, which, by the way, the Avidine will show you under frequencies. But sometimes you have to listen on a VOR, and that's when you might want to do it. Of course, you always want to ID any instrument approaches, even though the Avidine does it for you. But it works the exact same way. You push the bottom to select nav, twist right for the volume up, left for the volume down, and push it once to get the Morse code identifier. Now here's the great thing about the Avenine system. Under 110.6 will say, it will actually put the identifier of the VOR or the localizer if it hears the Morse code, and that counts as a legal identifier. Why is that awesome? Because now you don't have to listen to the Morse code and it reduces pilot workload. Single pilot IFR is so dangerous it's illegal in most of Europe because it's such high workload. So anything these units do, like the name of the air traffic control facility you're talking to, or particularly in this case, where they'll put the POM VOR, that reduces your workload. I still identify it, and I recommend everybody does by actually listening to it, because you may fly planes without an Avenine, and it's a good habit to be in, but you don't actually have to. I just fly hundreds of different planes every year, so it's a good habit for me. Come flip-flop, pretty easy. You just push the button, and it'll flip-flop. The green frequency is always active. The white frequency is always the standby. And that works the exact same way on the nav frequencies. So <clears throat> let me show you what it looks like when you tune comm radios. <clears throat> so you turn the little knob, and the first thing it's going to do is try and do it for you. So it will suggest the nearest airport in route and recent frequencies. Mm -hmm. So if I touch ATIS, you'll notice it automatically identifies it as Long Beach ATIS. If I use the big knob to go to the nearest in route frequencies, touch the bar, auto tunes, and we'll say Los Angeles Center. If I go to recents, I can touch a bar and push enter. The nice thing about the Avidine is there's 18 ways of doing everything, so whatever works for you. You can always manually tune it. Big knob changes big numbers, little knob changes little numbers. Flip-flop, back to Long Beach Tower. There's also a built-in keyboard, and all you have to do, 205, enter. It automatically will put the one in front and the two zeros behind it. You can also, of course, <coughs> use the really cool keyboard. 340 would make 134.0, enter, and it loads the SoCal approach. So the shortcut is, is you only need the three numbers. So if I want to do uh, 121.9, all I actually have to enter is 219 and push enter. It's a great shortcut. Let's show you what nav tuning looks like. Now, nav tuning has some even more possibilities. You can do it by knobs, frequencies, or even the name. If you don't have to look down at a chart to get the frequency, that's reduction of workload. That makes you safer. Let me show you how cool this looks. I'm going to switch to nav by pushing that button. Touch the standby frequency, or I can use the little knob. And I'll put in 113.6, big knob, big numbers, little knob, little numbers. That's LAX. 
Now it's not naming these because I'm on the ground at Long Beach and it's not picking up the frequencies. But I can also put in 15.7 for 115.7 Seal Beach. Other thing I can do is hit enter, ABC. I don't remember the frequency, but Pomona is what I want. 110.4, it's right there. Isn't that cool? And of course, don't forget that really cool wireless keyboard. Let's put it in the Paradise VOR, enter, automatically change it to 12.2. Now, another really cool thing about the Avidyne that I'm going to cover in my advanced classes is that it will do the VORs for you if it's part of your flight plan. So I'm on a very complicated flight plan from Santa Rosa, California back to Long Beach. I had to do like four different reroutes. And I'm plugging in VORs into the GPS flight plan while trying to get out of ice and bouncing around the cabin and all that cool stuff. And I put in GVO as my next waypoint. I go to hit the COM VLOC button in the bottom right or bottom left, sorry, is push select, and it's already tuned in the Gaviota frequency because I'm direct to it. It will automatically tune in the instrument approach frequency for you. Again, it just reduces your workload. So how do you pair this wonderful keyboard? Well, you get your key, you get your unit, you register it, and then they send you this keyboard. So I need you to show, I needed to show you how you actually make it work. So you go to the system, click download logs. This is under auxiliary and hit confirm. That will then turn the unit off for a second and then turn it back on in maintenance mode. Nothing you really do while it's resetting is going to do anything. It's looking for a USB device that's not there. So I'm going to cancel the reboot and use the auxiliary button rocker to the right and go to configuration. Big knob changes pages inside that. I'm just going to keep going until I get to the Bluetooth setup. There's my Bluetooth keyboard. I'm going to turn it on and I'm going to start the scan. It will now scan for compatible Bluetooth devices. Now, you may be able to pair other Bluetooth keyboards with it. I did not have any luck um, trying to link my first one um, that I typically use with my iPad, but it automatically picked up this one. And I'm going, gee, why, you know, why is it not picking up the, the actual Avidyne unit? Oh, you got to flip it over. And on the back, there's that button to the left of the Avidyne and look, it popped right up. See it right there? Now all you gotta do once it's found it is touch that stop scan button to the left. And if you don't, it's just gonna keep going forever. I'm gonna hit pair device and it's gonna ask me to enter 5393 on the keyboard, which I do and then push enter and it's paired. We're all good to go. Now I want to go back to the update page, click done. I don't want to cancel the reboot. It'll turn off and turn back on in the normal mode. Then once you push any button in the normal mode, it's going to ask you, do you want to let this thing work with the system? And all you have to do is just touch the allow button. And now your keyboard is paired. Now the clear button does a couple different things, but really all you have to remember about the clear button is it's either going to clear an entry, do a backspace, or acknowledge an alert. David Comero has a great question. Please repeat how you got into the setup mode. You go into the auxiliary, and then you go into the system, and you hit download logs. 
that will reset. The easiest way to get into the maintenance mode is actually just turn the thing off, put your USB key, which comes with the Avidine, which is how you update databases, put that USB key in and then just turn it on and it will automatically enter into maintenance mode. Direct2, well, Direct2 is pretty simple, but again, it'll do a couple different things. It will take you to the next waypoint in the flight plan or the waypoint that's currently selected in the flight plan. And of course, you can make it go to any waypoint. So let me show you how that works. So right now, I've got that little flight plan going in. I got an IFR flight plan going north. If I hit Direct2, Santa Barbara was the waypoint that was selected. Well, I don't want to do that, so I hit clear. And then I'm going to scroll up with the big knob to the waypoint I want to go to. I can touch Wilma and then just hit enter and enter again. So you always hit the enter button twice. Think of direct to, enter to. So you can also just change it to any waypoint. And notice how when I first put V, it picked V and Y. That's something called geofill. And one of my favorite features about these Avidine systems is it's smart. I don't have to scroll through V, then scroll to N, then scroll to Y. It's always going to pick the nearest waypoint to my position when I do direct to, or when I'm entering a flight plan, the nearest waypoint to my previous one. One of the things that just always drove me bananas about my previous system is every single time I'd put in the Santa Monica VOR, which is like a whole 18 miles from my home airport of Long Beach, it would always ask me, do you want the one in Mexico? No, I want the one 18 miles away, for God's sakes. And it just put in that extra step. The Avidine, because it's geofill and smarter, reduces pilot workload, which of course makes the thing system. So Joe has a question. Joe uh, Labrie, I'm sorry if I butchered that last name. How long will the charge on the keyboard last? You know, I don't know, um, but I used it for about seven hours um, over two different days, and it held just fine. I don't know how long it'll actually last, but if you're not using it a lot, what I'll do is a lot of times is I'll put in the flight plan with it, turn it off, put it in the seat back pocket, I don't use it a whole lot in flight. Um, I can use it in flight, but it's usually easier um, just to use the actual panel mount system. The cool thing about the keyboard, by the way, though, if anybody out there is an instructor like me, the really cool thing about the keyboard is not tell your students you have it and randomly change frequencies in their flight plan on them to see if they catch it. Fun with students. We all want to do it. Shyam, I'm sure I'm messing that up. Hi, Shyam. Does your IFD screen get too hot to touch? No, nope. I've never noticed any temperature change in it at all. Let's talk about the procedure key. So right now, I my nearest airport is Torrance. And my flight plan is direct to that airport. So if I hit procedure, it's going to load those approaches. So I'll select the ILS 29er, big knob down, select the seal beach approach. Now look what happens when I use the big knob to scroll through the flight plan. The GPS screen actually follows me so you can preview the approaches. I've activated the approach. It's reminding me, hey, you need to change it to the VOR localizer. So look, it automatically loaded 11.9, which is the Torrance localizer. I'll twist the CDI button and spin that course to 296. Now, if I reactivate that approach and hit vectors, I'll hit replace the active approach, replace it again. All I have to do is touch the map, and it's now become Vectors to final, and you notice I can pinch, zoom, and grab the map with my finger. Here's a professional tip. Never, ever use vectors to final. It's always considered wrong unless it's an emergency. 
you don't really ever want to use vectors to final. Now, if air traffic control says turn left vectors to final, that's fine. Do what ATC, but don't activate vectors to final on any GPS units because it messes up all the step down fixes. What you want to do is always activate the full approach and then activate the leg that you think you're going to intercept or one close to it. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's really important that the only time you actually use the activate vector to final on GPS units, and this is only my personal opinion, is in an emergency when you don't care about step down fixes. So the three chapters are the flight management system, the map chapter, and the auxiliary chapter. So let's look at the FMS chapter. Now each of those buttons, if you push them in the middle, that will take you to that chapter. And each one will rock to the left and to the right to change pages inside that chapter. Currently we are in the map chapter and we know that because it's lit up green. So. If I want to activate the FMS, boom, see it becomes green. And I rock it to the right, or I can touch soft keys. It's easier to use the rocker, by the way, than touch those little tiny labels, at least for my fat fingers, so I prefer the rockers. And inside each one, there's a bunch of different stuff. Like, let's look at approaches. Go back to weather, which I don't have. So let's try that again. Approaches and then touch the one, enter, and it'll actually show me a preview of that approach. Let's rock to the right and go to my route. There's my current route, a new route, or previously stored routes. There's a route up to Redlands. Waypoints. This is where you store custom waypoints, like the special flight rules area, which I'll show you how to do, but it's pretty easy to do a new one, and I'm going to cover this in great deals later, uh, great details later. Scroll over to the nearest. This is the one you want in an emergency. FMS all the way to the right, nearest. So let's find Torrance, direct to, enter to. So remember, it's the direct to button, the enter button two times. Direct to, enter to is how you use this thing in emergency. So Randy has a question about the CDI nub. Hey Randy, I'm actually going to cover it in a few minutes. And James has a comment about the keyboard. Apparently he asked Avidyne if it's smart enough to stop charging and he was told, no, that you can't overcharge that. I'm not sure on that. I totally believe you. Um, I'm going to check with my friends at Avidyne, and I'll get back to you. So let's look at the map chapter. Now, the map chapter really only has one page, but it's got a lot of functionality to it, so I still call it a chapter. So I'm in the auxiliary chapter. You know that because it's green. Just touch the center of the map. Boom, there's my map. Now I can pull data from the right, and that's the way I always fly it. You can slide it back and forth, you can touch it. I declutter the screen by taking all land data off and all nav data off, except for my flight plans, because I'm an IFR pilot and that's the best screen for me. But again, you can touch the button to the left. So zoom in using the little knob or pinching and you can drag them out and put all that gold airspace stuff back on. The biggest mistake people with fancy GPSs like this make is that they think the GPS replaces flight planning, which you should never do. The reason I don't leave a lot of airspace stuff cluttering up my maps is because I've pre-flighted and planned enough that I know my route will stay clear of it. So remember, you are required to get a weather brief before every flight out of the practice area. It's 91103. You're required to get weather information. 
and you're required to plan before you go. So although the Avonite is wonderful, and I think it's absolutely the best of the uh, NAVCOM systems right now, it does not replace actually making a flight plan, and you should be careful with that. <laughs> so Eugene Leonard, hi Eugene, has a great comment. Um, I think he's just talking about me, that that's a very small screen for us older people. Buddy, you wouldn't believe it looks a little small, but with the pinch zoom and decluttering a little bit, I actually think it's easier to read than some of the other systems out there, but there's a huge fix for that coming very soon that uh, I can't wait to show you at the end. So James Blodgett says, if I don't use vectors to final, how do you select a heading to be maintained to the leg of the approach you have selected? Well, that heading, James, actually comes assigned from air traffic control. So going into Long Beach for the ILS 3.0, I'll actually activate the full approach from mids, and they will give me headings. Fly a heading of uh, left turn heading 360, intercept the final. So the heading is actually given to me by ATC. In an emergency, if you've lost comm, you can just pick your own heading. But good question, buddy. So the pro tip to remember the zoom is really simple. Turning the knob left makes a larger picture. Turning right reduces the picture. So left zooms out, right zooms in, but left larger, right reduce is the memory aid. Let's talk about the auxiliary chapter and all the cool stuff in there. So I'm going to push the auxiliary button. And look, I've got some COM presets, all my Long Beach stuff loaded. I can change it to volume control. Push the rocker to utilities where I can put checklist. I haven't actually put in any checklist just yet. It's also got some calculators built in where I can do density altitude and all that kind of stuff. And some timers that are great to have for instrument use. I also have timer set in there to automatically change the fuel tanks every 30 minutes. On the setup, you change things with the little knob, move the cursor with the big knob, which should be familiar. If I cover the screen, I cover the light sensor, it gets darker. When I let go of the light sensor, it automatically gets brighter because auto for me is tied to that light sensor just above the CDI. Notice I have my aircraft ID, transponder codes, all that stuff automatically tuned in. You should leave most of this on, especially the terrain awareness. It's kind of a mistake for a lot of people to turn off terrain awareness because it annoys them. Well, that's all well and good if you fly in the flatlands, but three months later when you go into the mountains, it's going to kill you. So always leave your terrain alerts on for me. I can set up the map where it will only show me Airports with certain length runways, custom stuff, and all of this is covered in great detail in the five-hour class. I just want to show you a couple things. So this is the top of the map. It, I want to show ETA or destination ETA. Big knob over, and I want to make that one my ETA to my next waypoint. And then you can start adding right block options. So you really set this up the way you like it. And again, in the longer class, I'm going to show you um, my preferred IFR setup. And remember, big knob moves the cursor, little knob change things. You can also just drag your finger across it. Rocker to the right, there's your current software version. Rocker to the right will be a history of all the alerts, including any active ones. Now here's that CDI knob that somebody asked about. Pushing it goes to OBS. Twisting it changes the source. When would you want OBS? Well, it's really, really cool if you want to track a specific radial or heading away from a waypoint, and it doesn't even have to be a VOR. So for instance, right now I'm direct to Torrance. But let's say air traffic control said, 
uh, go to Torrance and fly on the 360 radial, or for any reason I wanted to do that. And this really came in handy in Southern California several weeks ago. I was flying home from uh, my other home in Big Bear, and the standard instrument clearance is to the Paradise VOR, the Paradise 270 radial, to join Victor 394. Well, I've never had a GPS actually show me the 270 radial before, and shocked the heck out of me when this bright green line showed up on my GPS because it matches what I'd set on the OBS. Let me show you this thing. So I'm going to push it to OBS. Now, push it back to GPS. Now I'm direct torrents. If I push it to OBS, remember torrents is what it's synced on. If I turn my OBS knob and show me, show me the 0789 radial from torrents, that's that pink line you see moving on the map. See how it's set to a from? Now, if I change it to the VOR localizer, you notice I have a nav thing. Now, I can't pick up any nav aids here on the ground. So what I'll do is I'll try and pit 115.7, but where my hanger is, it doesn't really pick up the Seal Beach VOR. So you notice I've got warning flags. But if I change it back to GPS, now it's in OBS mode still. And again, notice I've got from, and now look, I've got to. So if somebody told you to fly direct to on a certain radial, you can see me moving that line. Wouldn't that have been great when you did your instrument training? If they said intercept the 360 radial to Seal Beach, how much better that would have been? And then we can always go back to direct to. The light sensor. Really do if you put your finger over it and it's set to work off the light sensor, which is my preferred thing. I don't like it on the, the dimming bus. I prefer things on the light sensor. If you put your finger over, it's going to get dark. If you shine light in it, it's going to get brighter. So it's very easy to see even in very, very bright sunlight. So what we'll do is when it becomes bright outside, it becomes brighter. When it becomes dark inside, it dims down. So let's create a user waypoint. So very popular in Southern California is the special flight rules area to get through LAX. But it is entirely based on the Santa Monica 132 radial. A lot of people mess this up. It's not anywhere between the shoreline and the freeway. That's wrong. It's illegal. It's dangerous. It's only on the Santa Monica 132 radial. Except several months ago, the Santa Monica VOR went out of service. So all these people are blasting through here, happily announcing their tail number for anyone in the LAX FISDO that wanted to listen, going back and forth using ForeFlight or an iPad. Well, that's just 100% wrong and pretty clear a violation of the FARs. You may never use an iPad for any form of primary navigation unless you declare a Mayday. So I know you want to go get the tri-tip at Camarillo, but it's probably not an emergency. You just violated the law. You can, however, use a panel mount GPS because you're still slant golf if you can put in the radial and some landmarks to make it, which is very, very easy on the Avidyne. So there's the 132 radial, and I want to create a custom waypoint just south of the surface Bravo area right there. So my flight plan would be SFRA, my custom waypoint at the bottom, up to Santa Monica or reverse if I'm going southeast. So I pull out a paper map. Yeah, they actually still make those. Lay out a plotter and I figure out it's about eight miles south will clear me of the LAX class Bravo. So let's try that. Let's do a custom waypoint. I'm going to touch FMS, waypoint is selected. I'm going to push new. Let's name it SFRA. Enter. I don't know the latitude and longitude. That's far beyond me. So I'm going to change it to radial distance. The fix is SMO. And look how it geofills, automatically fills it in for me. The radial 
is going to be the 1, 3, 2 radial, enter. And the distance was 8 miles, enter. Now I'm just going to hit the enter button to save that. Guess what? Let's do get rid of all the land data, get rid of all the nav data to show you what that will look like. So FMS, route, new route, enter, and I'll name it, oh, try that again here. See how my finger doesn't work even when the plane's not moving? It's not the Avidine, I just got greasy, smudgy fingers. We'll name it SFRA. And you'll notice I get a switch tanks alert because I've been on for 30 minutes. I'm not even moving and it's telling me to switch tanks. Enter. So what I'll do is I'll create the origin. Enter, which is KLGB, enter. Enter again, waypoint, SFRA, enter. Enter again for the next waypoint. Enter, SMO. And again, you see that geofill. See how fast it fills things in for me? Good. Let's go back to route list. Activate my route. Yep, that's the route I want to look at. And let's see it on the map. Zoom out, drag, and look. There's my special flight rules route, which is a perfect legal alternative, even if the Santa Monica VOR is out of service. Ashley Mullen. Hey, Ashley. Has a great question. Will the Avidine let you put in more than one waypoint with the same name, or will it let you create a custom waypoint where it matches one previously in the database? No, no, it won't. It will absolutely warn you and not let you do that. Great question. So let's do a basic VFR flight plan. FMS flight plan. Enter. Waypoint selected, enter, and I want to go to the special flight rules area, enter, enter again for the next waypoint. And you'll notice the map is following me while I do this. SMO, I'll do this one by the keyboard, enter. And see how the map is drawing it out for me? Enter, waypoint, let's go to, touch it, K. Okay. C, M, A, Geofill filled it for me. Let's go get some tri-tip at the cool barbecue restaurant. View the cursor, and you'll notice you can now preview the entire route. Activate the flight plan. My first waypoint is the SFRA with a course of 282. I'm ready to go. Now, IFR flight planning is just as easy. It's the easiest system I've ever used. Let's do Santa Barbara. So let's go new route and I'm going to name it IFR to Santa Barbara. I'm tired of the barbecue and I want to go get a club at the Beachside Cafe. Enter. So I hit enter for the origin. It's going to be Long Beach. And the origin, it's where I am at the time. Enter again. Let's do the Anaheim 6 departure. Enter. The Ventura transition. Enter. Enter for the next waypoint. Touch waypoint. Quang. Enter. Enter again for the next waypoint. Let's go to the airport. K. S. And look, Geofill fixes it for me. Good. Now I want to select Santa Barbara and I want to load the approach. You always want to load the approach before you go. A, make sure the approach exists. Sometimes Jeppesen has data glitches. B, you're set up before you go. Let's do the VOR25 from Quang. Enter. Good. Now it's all in there. So compact brings hides some of the interior stuff. Expanded shows every little waypoint. That looks all about right. Back to route list. It's already touched. Activate it. 
confirm. And look, there it is. And when I hit view expanded, now the flight plan's off to the right. So if I touch each waypoint or I use a big knob to scroll, you can now preview your route. And this should be done before every single flight plan before you depart to make sure it's right. And this is one of the great things about the system. It will make you safer if you do it. So Coil has a pretty good question. Hey, Cole. Coil. Can I compare the screen performance, brightness, and re resolution with an iPad? Same question about a touch screen. Um, the brightness is awesome. The resolution is very good, but it's not an iPad. Uh, Apple puts a lot of billions of dollars or whatever into developing retina screens and things like that. Um, and especially the new iPad Pro, brightness and display is awesome. But I will tell you, I've flown this in pitch black night, and I've flown it in very bright noonday sun, and never had a problem seeing it. Now, the performance of the touchscreen is a little... That's a little more complex question. I will tell you it's very, very good. I, however, have kind of fat fingers. So a lot of times, it's not its not the Avidine problem. It's me and too much barbecue and club sandwiches, apparently. My finger's kind of big and it, you know, small screen. I it, Sometimes it, it's a little off. But I don't use the touch screen for programming. I only use the touch screen for pinch zoom and moving around the map. And it works awesome for that, especially uh, my last, you know, several hours have been hard IFR with a lot of turbulence. I don't use a touchscreen for anything. I will tell you, though, it, it works just as good as the iPad performance on the touchscreen. So I hope I answered that for you. So what's an IFR approach look like in real life? Well, I can show you that. Now, I will tell you all of my programs. I'm very proud that the video is shaky because we don't use simulators in any of our video training courses. It's just not my gig. I don't care what a simulator does. I want to show you all real life. So we are on a nice bouncy approach. Uh, there's some cells to the left of us, nothing quite on our, our uh, localizer. We're doing the ILS uh, into Santa Rosa, Sierra Tango Sierra, if anybody wants to look it up. And let me show you, we're about to the EDOVE intersection, and I want to show you what it looks like when it switches over to Pigpen. You'll notice I'm on the localizer to the left, but I'm below the glide slope. I haven't gotten to my final, and I haven't intercepted the glide slope yet. So you'll notice pink and white is past EDOVE. That's the next course, and it will tell me 10 seconds before what I should be on for the next one, and that's a warning get ready to go to the next one. I can zoom in there, and then it's automatically kicked over to a solid pink line, which means now I'm on my way to the runway tree two. Updating the database is very, very easy. Use the Jeppesen program, and your Avidyne comes with an eight megabyte USB key. So all you do is you update it, plug it in, turn the unit on, and that automatically goes into maintenance mode. Hey, you've got an update to do. You can hit select all or just do the one you want, and then I'm going to update the database. This takes a few minutes because not only is it updating it, it's going to check that the file's not corrupted as well. So we'll sit there and let it come in. You can see the progress go up. You can also download logs. You can save checklists. You can save settings. One of the cool things about the Avidine is you can actually save three or four different pilot profiles. So I have one partner in the plane. He can set up the map he wants it and leave it under his name. I can set up the map and everything I want it and put it under my name. So you can have different profiles, which is really, really cool. You can also save the checklist. Why would you want to save the checklist? Well, you might want to put it in a different unit. And there's all kinds of cool things on that. So we're just going to let it update here for a second. It goes pretty quick.
Copy and mirror stuff. Hey, it works. Hit done. It will now automatically reboot into normal mode. You actually don't have to pull the USB key out. I would. I'd pull the USB key out at this point because I don't want to bump it and break it. But you don't have to. It'll automatically do that. So Michael had a question. Why do I uh, manually switch a VLOC? I'll get there in just a second, buddy. So see how I bumped it? I'm going to push enter. Look, the nav data is now current, but the worldwide obstacles is still not current. I have current obstacle databases in other things, so I don't typically update it on my panel mount stuff. Are you sure you want to fly with an expired rear? Yes, I do. So Mike, you had a great question. This is from Michael Bauer. Why do I switch to the VLOC manually on an approach? The 440 will do it automatically. Um, that is totally true, but I actually had that setting turned off because I wanted to show it manually done for the video. So Tony has a, a, a good question. Do I have any trouble with a mixed Garmin Avidine setup? N no, um, but I will tell you, I'm an expert in Garmin Avionics and I'm very quickly becoming uh, pretty darn good at this Avidine system. I can use both, no problems at all. If you were going to buy a plane with all steam gauges and antique kicks 155s, and in a dream world, if you wanted to totally upgrade the panel, I would do an all Avidyne panel. Now, Avidyne works with a bunch of different devices. So if you have a Garmin GTX transponder, it'll work with the Avidyne. If you have a Garmin audio panel, it'll work with the Avidyne. Avidyne will work with anything. But GPS units, the best system out there would be a 540, or actually the new 550, and a 440 for most panels. Because competing GPS units won't talk to each other. But the Avidyne 440 will work with a ton of stuff. It works with storm scopes and fuel readouts and adds be I mean, Avidyne is the most friendly of all these systems. It'll work with pretty much anything. The list of compatible devices it works with is too long to go into. Um, but do I have a problem flying with an Avidyne on the top, a Garmin on the bottom, fly Q on an iPad and four flight on my iPhone 6? No, I'm just used to it, but I kind of teach it for a living, so not a big deal to me. All right. So now there's an important thing about updating your database. There is a legal requirement that most pilots don't do. And this is a legal requirement if you're going to use any panel mount certified GPS with a database. I don't care if you're a runner pilot or not. This is a legal requirement before IFR flight. But most people don't even know about it. So here's my Jeppesen server. I've already updated my database. Okay, so let me show you a couple options. There's my tail number. There's my current database. If I click service details, it'll show my current cycle, even show my renewal date. There's my coverage, but this is the part that's really interesting. You can look at the update history. That's great. But here's the legal requirement that most people don't do that you are required to. Go up to the top, Quick Links. Click on Alerts and Notices. Now, if you don't have the program, you can actually just go to jeppesen.com and go to Alerts. Click on the United States. Click on Nav Data Alerts. And look, there's a change to a GPS procedure after the database was already put in your GPS. And what it does is it's changed the crossing altitude at some of those approaches. So a person asked me a question the other day. I was teaching a uh, live seminar here at Long Beach. He said, listen, I was flying somewhere in Northern California and I pushed procedures and the procedure I want wasn't there. It was in for flight, but it wasn't in the GPS. And I go, did you check jeppesen.com for the alerts? Because it was a glitch in the system, a procedure got left out. 
So it is legally required that you check jepson.com for aviation alerts on your database, even if you're a renter pilot, because you want to see if there's been a change in the procedure. What if the decision altitude has been bumped up 200 feet because of an obstacle? That's required information. You want to know that. Or what if an approach in the Jeppesen database is glitched? You want to know about that. So this is a legal requirement that most people don't know, but now you do, so you'll look smarter than everybody else. So let's put the Wi-Fi position on the iPad. Now, really kind of cool thing is if you don't have an external GPS, you don't need one anymore. The Avidine will actually share all of the GPS data onto several different iPad programs and more and more are happening every day. So touch settings on the iPad, Wi-Fi, turn on the Wi-Fi, and the one you want to link is called Lio Wi-Fi. Ta-da, it's linked. Now, open up uh, a program, and I'm going to open up ForeFlight for this case. Flying, ForeFlight. Touch my Locate button, and look, it found me. I'm still on the ground at Long Beach. So that will give you GPS altitude, GPS ground speed, all that kind of cool stuff. Now, here's something important to know. The Avidine Wi-Fi is actually a secured network. So you might want to know the Wi-Fi password. Because interesting enough, it's actually not in the pilot's guide. So everybody, ready? Write this down. The Wi-Fi password for all the Avidine 440s are A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, it's not the most imaginative, but that's actually what it is. And you need that password. So take a picture of the screen with your iPhone. Write it down real quick. Uh, when you get your Avidine, you're going to want to link to the Wi-Fi. That's how you do it. Now, I will tell you, I don't typically link for Flight or FlyQ uh, to the Avidine because I have a Stratus Ads B system, which I prefer because it's got a built-in AHARS and also gives me Ads B traffic and Ads B weather, something I don't have yet connected to the Avidine system. Now, you can buy those components. I just don't have them yet. So I have the little $900 Stratus as B unit, and that's what I link. But the biggest problem I always had is the Stratus will run for like eight hours. My iPad always died after three. Now with that cool USB port charging my iPad, I don't have to worry about it anymore. But if you just want a great external GPS, much better than any handheld external GPS, you can absolutely link it to that. I do want to spend just a second talking about the CAS system. And the caution advisory system, CAS, and some other uh, manufacturers call it a crew alert system, which is kind of what I always do because that's what I learned first. There's three colors. There's warning, caution, and advisory. Warning is red. That means you need to do something right now. Caution is you need to do something before it becomes critical. And blue is, hey, something you need to know. So what's an important warning you might be interested in? An imminent ground collision. That is an emergency climb. Now I want to talk to you about terrain. I'm not going to go big into terrain in this course because I'm, I'm already running long. But yellow does not mean you're safe in any terrain system. Yellow means you're between 100 and 1,000 feet. You need to be climbing. I teach mountain flying for a living, folks. Mountain downdrafts can be 2,000 feet per minute. If you're... 300 feet above terrain and you think you're safe because the little screen is yellow, you're wrong. Red is emergency climber action. So a caution or a yellow might be, hey, there's terrain, but you're not going to hit it for about a minute or 60 seconds. Again, yellow does not mean you're safe. You still need to institute a climb. Or you might see something like this you have a voltage problem. And this can be kind of the cool first warning that you've lost your alternator. When it, low volts is detected, it will warn you 
It'll reduce the backlight maximum, and it can even reduce the voltage in the transmissions. Advisories, those are the blue color bike. I have mine programmed to hit every 30 minutes to remind me to switch the tanks on the Cessna 206 because the Cessna 206, unlike most Cessnas, is left or right, never both. Well, I think we've covered, geez, just about a ton. I'm running on uh, an hour and 40 minutes instead of an hour and 30 minutes. So I think we better just turn this thing off. Press and hold and keep holding. Good. Well, we're done with that. But we're not quite done with you. I've covered a lot, and I've covered as fast as I possibly can, and I really hope you've gotten a lot out of it. But I just don't have the time to go into every detail and really make you a pro yet. There's some stuff. I don't have even time to glance at. Like, oh my God, the cool new 550 with the synthetic vision views. Or the fact that you can put electronic charts on the 540 and the 550. The terrain view on the 540 and the 550. Or its own app that somebody asked me a question before about little screens and old people. How about a free giant display? The IFD 100, which is a free app um, that will be released shortly, and I think it's going to be released in July, um, pretty close to Oshkosh, if I'm not sure, makes it the biggest display you've ever seen. And that's a mini. You plug an iPad Pro somewhere in your, com um, your cockpit, and it's fully controls. And every little bit, it just makes a giant display. This is the free G1000 bigger, better screen. It is awesome. That's one view. And how about that great synthetic vision view, right? So how do you use all this stuff? Well, read the pilot's guide. It's A, it's legally required that you got to have it in the cockpit during use. That's with all panel mount systems. But you actually got to read it. What I do for a living, folks, is I go around the country, and you can hire me to come in for one or two or three days, and I'll make you a pro at IFR, and I'll make you a pro at your new systems, and I love traveling, and I go to Canada, I go to Florida, I don't care where you are, I'll come to you. But you could save a lot of money before I came in or another master instructor came in if you read the pilot's guide first. And Avidyne even gives you a free simulator that you can download on your iPad. So... Click on App Store, search for Avidyne. I'm going to do the non-international version, and poof. There's an Avidyne 540 for you. And just start randomly pushing buttons and play with it and twist it. And it's actually very good. Now, the only difference between the 540 and the 440 is it actually displays COM and NAV frequencies and has a bigger map. Other than that, they're identical. But you can twist stuff. You can get alerts. It's got a simulator. It'll fly a flight plan for you. So grab the POH, read through it, play with this, and that is a really good start. I will tell you the most dangerous pilot in the history of man is the pilot who flies with avionics that they have not been trained to use. GPS and especially the iPad systems have caused an increase in pilot deviations and FA violations in some FISDOs on the account of tenfold because people don't understand how to use them correctly. So you would never let somebody who had 20 hours in a steam gauge airplane solo a G1000 without some training from an instructor. So a short video like this is a good start. Reading the POH is a good start. Playing with the simulator is a real good start. But get some expert instructions and practice with somebody before you go flying. That is critical to safety. So if you need some help on the Avidyne, I'm going to answer a bunch of questions just in a minute. But if you have a question afterwards and it's a simple question, go over to pilotsafety.org. That's where you'll find me. Click Ask the Experts and you can send me a question. I do want to put some limitations out there. Uh, I had somebody last year get really, really upset because I didn't respond at 1.30 in the morning. I'm sleeping at 1.30 in the morning. 
I volunteer for pilotsafety.org. Hey, I started the thing and I love it, but I do sleep occasionally and I do have to work and feed my family too. So it may take one or two days, but I'll get back to you as long as you give me one or two little simple questions. If you're on the 10th question, you probably need to hire an instructor, but I'm happy to start out with a little bit. Go over to the classes and you'll see live classes and live webinars that I'm teaching. Especially if you're anywhere near Dallas, Texas, we got a live all day hands on four flight class that I'm teaching on uh, May 28th. I'm teaching an advanced IFR techniques webinar on May 19th and I just did a free live class. Now, if you keep on that classes, because you're going to see more and more live and Avidine webinars as well. If you want to actually have me, if you think I'm funny, if you think I'm helpful and you want to have me come to your house, come to your plane or you can come to me. Uh, I'll actually come to wherever you are. Fly your plane in your place and you can find me over at masterflighttraining.com. And of course, a really good start that will help support pilot safety, our, our volunteer group is you can actually head on over there right now and pre-order a five, almost six hour course that is very detailed all about the Avidine systems on DVD or USB stick. And uh, mid-June, it'll even be able, uh, available as an online video. All right, let's start plugging through some questions here. Let me see what I've got. <laughs> Brock Steiner. Shameless plug. He's got a brand new IFD 440 on sale on Barnstormers because he decided to put in the 540 instead. Way to go, Brock. Way to just upgrade to the bigger screen. That's awesome. Ashley. Hi, Ashley has a question. There was a time on the caution re message regarding low voltage. What's with that? Well, Ashley, that's in an alternator failure. Or when I'm just draining the battery, doing a lot of ground videos, that's what happened there. But that's what you would see typically in flight on an alternator failure. Ken has a question. Is the 550 compatible with the Garmin 530 like plug and play replacement? I believe it is. Derek has a good question. How is the COM preset list used? Well, what you use it for is I'm going to, because I'm always going out of Long Beach or uh, Big Bear, I just preset in order all of the frequencies I need. ATIS, then clearance, then ground, then the two different towers, then the first two SoCal approaches. So I can just go dink, 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 and I don't have to tune them in. I can just keep hitting the button. And you can even install buttons on your yoke that will automatically cycle through that kind of cool stuff. Coil Schwab. Can a 540-440 combination share a JEP subscription or are they separate subscriptions? You know, I'm not 100% sure, Coil, but I'm, I really do think it's two different subscriptions. Pretty sure that's how Avidine does. But Avidine does give discounts on bundled. And I think just the nav database for my IFD uh, 440 was about 300 bucks. Uh, Ed Danford actually answered the question. He says it's one subscription. Um, they can share it in the same plane. Thanks, Ed. Um, the really cool thing, when I say this thing is plug and play, I mean it is plug and play. I had the Garmin in there. I yanked the Garmin out. I dropped in the Avidine. I called Jeppesen. I said, listen, I just replaced my Garmin with the Jeppesen. Uh, can I get a credit or something? And they're like, no, you're done. They, it was the same cost, and they just moved me over. They literally, in one phone call, just swapped me out, and I didn't have to pay a dime to swap out the new one. Chris LaRosa, what is my website? I have two, buddy. Pilotsafety.org is the volunteer group that you see on the screen. Um, that's where we sell the... Uh, very in-depth training and we do a bunch of free training videos and about 10,000 FA Wings credits all over the U.S. My personal website where I actually make a living is masterflighttraining.com. Y'all, I think I've run a little bit over. I've had a great time. I hope you have too. I will see you on the next one and enjoy that new Avidine. I know I will.